All right, in this lesson we are looking at cellular respiration. This is the last section of topic one in unit one, so please make sure you are up to date. All right, cellular respiration is a controlled release of energy from organic compounds to produce ATP. Right, recall that ATP is adenosine triphosphate, which is our cell's energy currency. Essentially, our cells are breaking down organic molecules to make some kind of energy. The organic molecules we're talking about might be, you know, glucose or carbohydrates. Sometimes proteins and amino acids can be broken down, um, and plants use lipids and carbs that they previously made during photosynthesis. So remember, this is a function of all cells. All cells undergo cellular respiration. So you might be talking specifically muscle cells. They need to get glucose. They need to go through cellular respiration to gain, um, you know, the, the water, the energy, and the you know carbon dioxide to uh, you know contract. All right. If we look a little bit more closely at ATP, it has a nitrogenous base just like DNA, as well as a ribose sugar and three phosphates. Okay, one, one, two, three. So the third phosphate on the end here we're going to look at, uh, the third phosphate basically has a high energy bond, which is a chemical potential energy sitting there, right, ready to happen. So ATP is made by charging up a molecule of ADP. Um, and once, you know, it, it's used as energy when required because we cleave off that extra third phosphate, which releases the energy to be used elsewhere. Now, interestingly, ATP does not move between cells, so cells need a continuous supply of this energy being created from the ATP. Now, ATP serves so many functions. It is needed to make macromolecules, uh, to transport things across membranes, as well as transporting things within cells. So energy is used and lost to the environment as heat. Okay, so it can't be reused once it's been done. Um, it can be really hard to wrap your head around the idea of all these transformations happening. Cellular respiration can go either one of two ways, and it's going to depend on whether oxygen is present. So they both start with the same pathway, but then the presence of oxygen will decide which way it's going to go after that. Very first step, regardless of which pathway it's going to take, is glycolysis. And what this does is it turns glucose molecules into pyruvate. Um, and glucose is a six rings in a carbon, basically. That's how you'll see it drawn all the time, whilst pyruvate is um, a three carbon atom in a chain. So if you look at it a really simplistic way, we're essentially just cutting that glucose in half um, and, you know, creating these two molecules that are very similar. So if we start with aerobic respiration in the eukaryotic cells, this is occurring in the mitochondria and it's occurring in the presence of oxygen. It is the complete breakdown of glucose in the presence of oxygen, and it's going to form a lot of ATP, so 34 to 36 molecules of ATP. Now, carbon dioxide is the waste product. We can see that here. Um, you know, water is technically a waste product here, but the organism can use that water again in some other form. And this is all occurring inside the mitochondria within the cytoplasm of a cell. Anaerobic respiration, however, is only going to occur with you know, no presence of oxygen there, and it's only a partial breakdown of glucose. Um, you know, the oxygen is not there to finish the entire process, so it's only going to produce minimal ATP. We're talking two ATP molecules. However, it is super fast, and it can give you a short burst of rapid energy if it's required. So it's usually only occurring where oxygen is deficient in the environment for that organism. So we talked about earlier, regardless of whether oxygen is present, the first step of respiration is always going to be that glycolysis, where the glucose molecule is essentially chopped in half. But if no oxygen is present at that point, then the pyruvate can go on to form other products. All right, so the products are going to depend on what kind of organism we're talking about. In humans, it creates lactic acid or lactate. In yeast and plants, we're making ethanol and carbon dioxide. So these products are waste products, and they can be toxic if they start to accumulate in excess within the organism but we can manipulate them so that we can take them you know take advantage of this situation these processes aren't set in stone if oxygen becomes available again the organism can then go back and kind of go through the aerobic respiration so if we identify the type of organism that's going through the anaerobic respiration, we can talk about what the product is. If we're talking, say, lactic acid in humans, this is occurring in the cytoplasm. And this is part of our evolutionary fight or flight style mechanism because it's helping muscles to contract, right? Um, you know, we have to increase lactic acid. Uh, sorry, if lactic acid does increase because there is not enough oxygen, uh, because we've had a short burst of energy in a short period of time, then it can actually start to accumulate 
in the muscles and it can you know that's that muscle burn and fatigue so there's an oxygen debt and that means that once you've started and you're trying to go through the aerobic respiration your body needs to start those deep breathings to replenish the oxygen supply so eventually the uh, aerobic respiration will occur and create more ATP now anaerobic respiration in yeasts bacteria and plants is known as fermentation uh, and in plants and yeasts, you know, we're making things like ethanol and CO2 while bacteria can create lactic acid like animals. But these are products that we can use but in, in industry, essentially. So if we look at all the different products of fermentation, yeah, we start with the pyruvate, but then once there's no oxygen present, we can make those other kinds of products. Um, so lactic acids used in the dairy industry, CO2 and ethanol, beer and bread making, CO2 also in bread making, you know, makes the bread really fluffy and ethanol, uh, also not just, you know, alcohol for drinking, but biofuels. All right, so cellular respiration, like almost every other cellular process, is enzyme controlled. So temperature, therefore, is going to denature any enzymes and therefore affect the rate of cellular respiration occurring. Glucose and oxygen concentrations work the exact same way that substrate concentrations work in enzymes. So there's going to be, you know, a really big steep increase and then it eventually will plateau off at some point. And in pH there, um, you can see that it's going to work the same way. It's going to denature the enzymes if it's too high or too low. So there's that optimal zone there. Apologies for my scribble. Now, photosynthesis and respiration are complementary processes. Photosynthesis uses the waste products of cellular respiration, right, to, and then, you know, adds in light energy to create those organic compounds. Yep, makes sense. And the cycle continues over and over. Although they have the opposite products and reactants, they are not direct reversals of one another in terms of the chemical reactions that's occurring. So it's really important that we are careful with the language that we are using. Yes, they are complementary, but they are not exact opposite processes. Right, so have a read of all of these and make sure you are making some links between cellular respiration and photosynthesis.